Good morning. Welcome to worship on the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. And as the bell rings, I welcome you to worship with the announcements. Youth group today, Plant Center bringing over a group. We're also going to take a walk around town, highlighting hunger concerns. I will be gone Monday and Tuesday at Lakeshore Center at Okoboji, a Presbyterian Conference Center. Our Leadership Council for the Presbytery is holding an annual retreat. I will be back sometime Wednesday about noon. Good News Club, 3.30. Rita, if I could again ask you to do prayer meeting as I'll be en route. Good News Club at 3.30, Sharpsburg Bible Study, Thursday at 3.15. And next Sunday, a nominating committee meeting here at Lennox, 5 p.m. I've been asked to put that in the bulletin. Also, if you'd like to make plans two weeks ahead, the Sharpsburg Presbyterian Church is having in two weeks their harvest dinner, free will offering, and it's homemade beef and noodles over mashed potatoes, a variety of salads and pies, and wonderful fellowship. Harvest dinner at Sharpsburg on the 30th. Are there other announcements to be made? Then let us worship God. Our song of preparation comes from the trip I took to North Carolina from a Tensei service held at the Collegiate Presbyterian Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. You know it, you can join right in, but we'll sing it for you one time and then we'll sing it two more. It goes like this. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Oh Lord, hear my prayer.
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I declare to you the truth, in Jesus Christ your sins are forgiven. In response, join me in the hymn of praise, number 19 in your hymn book, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
So, Moses, he essentially prayed to God when they got attacked by the Amalekites with his hands. You know what he did? He lifted them up. And as long as he had his hands up, Israel was winning the battle. But guess what happened? Have you ever stood like this with your hands up? You know what eventually happens? You get tired. And your arms fall down. And Moses' arms fell down. And guess what happened when his arms fell down? The enemy started to win. So he put his arms back up. And then Israel would be winning. And then his arms would get tired. And the enemy would be winning. So guess what happened? Two of his right-hand men, one by the name of Joshua and one by the name of Hur, they came up to Moses <coughs> and they held his arms up. When he started to get tired, they held him up. And sure enough, Israel won the battle and they were able to continue their journey to the promised land. Thank you, Herb. Thank you, Joshua. You may be seated. So the Bible often tells stories and doesn't tell us the lesson we're supposed to learn. But here's what I learned. Sometimes it's not enough to go it alone or to pray alone. We need others to help us, right? Just like Moses needed Joshua and her to hold up his arms, so we need other people to hold us up in prayer. Praying is not something we have to do alone. It's something we can do together. And you know what's happening today all around the world? Kids are praying. And I'm going to teach you this song. It's in your bulletin. And it goes like this. It's from Vacation Bible School, long ago. All around the world, kids are praying. All around the world, praying to God. Children, lift your hands and voices saying, Hear our prayer, O God. All around the you guys ready to do motions with me? Yes. Yes, her. <laughs> Here we go. Are you ready, Savannah? Are you ready, Lightning? Here we go. All around the world, kids are praying. All around the world, praying to God. Children, lift your hands and voices say. We'll take you down where we have a coloring sheet about the quail. You may go. Joys and concerns today. I reach into my pocket because I'll start with two that came to me by a text this morning. Nina McCall died last night, 10 p.m. at the Corning Hospital. Received a call from her daughter this morning. Ask us to please lift up the McCall family in prayer. And early this morning, Howard Stokes died. Got a text first from Mandy, then Teresa, letting me know and asking that we pray for the Stokes family. So the McCall family and the Stokes family, if we would pray for them today. Patty? Steve Sawyer, after several trips to the emergency room, was admitted to the hospital on Friday. 
He's there now getting tests. Tomorrow he goes through evaluations to see what's next. Connie is with him now. They are worshiping with us unless his medical tests interfere. So we lift up Steve and Connie in our special prayers. Others today? Yes, continued prayers for Faith Cordell. Two breaks in her foot. And she's getting along but still not getting around well. Yes. Uh, we celebrate uh, Mom's birthday. Uh, it will be uh, Tuesday. And we are so happy that she's able to come to church with us. And as good as she is, at 92 now. Darlene Freeman turning 92 on Tuesday. Darlene? What? It's our <laughs> practice in the church, and Roberta Lockhart started it. She said, when you get to 90, if you can show up in church around your birthday, you get sung to. <laughs> so, Christy, why don't you come up here, since it's your grandmother turning, and join us or lead us in the singing, and Becky has it for us. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, you can clap for that. Thank you. All of you who don't know me, I'm Darlene Freeman. <laughs> You might pan the camera to her there at the time. <laughs> I have a couple more from my text messages. Betty Markson sent a Brenda update this morning. She had had three good days in a row this week. This is this morning's update. Well, I think we finally found the correct antibiotic to clear up the pneumonia. Brenda has been coughing up stuff since two a.m. Got morning meds and the nurse literally blew my J2 feed line. So no food again today till I get downstairs to get it replaced. I'm going to sleep this day away, says Brenda. Exhausted doesn't even begin to describe it. Brenda with her double lung transplant still struggling toward health and we still need to continue to remember her in prayer. Brenda Noose. Markson or Markson News. Others today? Val's sister Vanessa Carson, we lift her up in prayer. I see another one. Willie Agins. His daughter, Deanna Grider, and Deanna and Gary were here while I was in North Carolina. I did not get to see them. They left as I was coming back. But we continue to remember Willie, Deanna, and Debbie as two daughters in our prayers. Also, from Jamie Henscombe, series of tests this week, I think, for her striving to become a teacher. A teacher. And she asked if the church would lift her up in prayer today. One of our members, Jamie Hanscom, who was already a teacher's aide, but going to become a full-time teacher. And boy, do we need teachers. So lots of prayers for Jamie Hanscom. I just have a question. Are we allowed to hug a cougar on her birthday? Yes, you may hug Darlene on her birthday. Even though she's a cougar, he said. That's a, that's a wonderful looking older woman. That's all I can say. Thank you, Craig, for calling that to our attention. With my son, the loving. We graduated together. I bring a joy from the Sharpsburg Church. Um, Ashley, who once was Ashley Nelson, and I can't think of her last name, was in Malta competing in a 
barrel racing competition and won <laughs> early this morning. So she brings back the America's Cup for barrel racing back to the United States, a multinational competition won by Ashley. So if we could lift up prayers for Ashley. <laughs> and prayers for her son, Payson, who was left at home. Kathy and Chuck Johnson, grandparents, are down there taking care of them, but he has a little growth under his jaw. They also asked for prayer for Payson. Yeah, there it is, Jean. I know I said one. Prayers for Harold and Linda Spring as they celebrate uh, Saturday their 50 years in the store down there. Thank you, Jeannie, for bringing that up because they wanted me to announce and I forgot. They're okay. having an open house from 2 to 4. Free root beer floats. <laughs> and prizes to be drawn. Harold loves prizes. So they have prizes that you can win. Come from 2 to 4 and celebrate with Harold and Linda Spring 50 years. And, Harold, um, and they have just stayed open so much for the community. I just, I'm just so proud of them because the little town needs it and the little, little community needs it and they've been there for them. Harold and Linda, and if I can just do a shout out for Harold and Linda, I've been told that there's only three ways to make money in a little store. Lottery tickets, alcohol, tobacco. And Linda refuses to sell any of the three. <laughs> they lose money, but they stay open for sharks. Let us remember the people of Ukraine and Gary, a report on our brothers and sisters from El Salvador. The hurricane hit and Berlin, where our, our sister parishes are, had the most rain, they had a foot of rain and uh, mudslides, took the crops are about a month away from gathering, but it ruined most of the crops and the roads are still closed and the electricity is still on. Our brothers and sisters in Berlin hit with the Pacific hurricane and devastated. We lift them up along with the people of Ukraine. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, even as we celebrate joys, Darlene's 92nd birthday, Harold and Linda's 50 years of running a store in Sharpsburg, we remember that there are many not rejoicing today. There are many who are grieving. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine, our brothers and sisters in El Salvador, our brothers and sisters all around the world, even here, who are hungry or cold. We pray for the McCall family, Nina, a wonderful 98 years of life. We pray for the Stokes family and Howard's 89 years of life. We lift up Steve and Connie Sawyer, praying, Lord, that the doctors might discover what's going on and help Steve find healing and peace. We pray for Faith as she recovers, for Valeria's sister, Vanessa. We pray for Brenton Noose, Lord, that this pneumonia might go away, that health might be regained. We pray for Jamie as she takes tests toward being a teacher for Ashley as she celebrates a wonderful victory in Malta riding a horse. We pray for Willie Agins, for Deanna and Gary Greider, for his daughter Debbie. We pray for all those we have not named, but we keep in our hearts, Lord, those who are sick, those who are grieving. And we pray today for Marilyn Maxa on the four-year anniversary of the death of my father, Vern. Keep her, Lord, in your care. Help her. Help all those who grieve. Hear us as we pray the prayer that you taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our song of prayer today, and by the way, the theme of the whole service today is prayer, is the song that was lifted up at Vintage Park when I asked for a request at my latest service out there. What a friend we have in Jesus. 408. Remain seated.
Christ we pray. Amen. Listen as I read to you about the importance of prayer from the scriptures of Psalm, James, and Luke. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Our final reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not lose heart. In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he de delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? I might as well admit to you what you've probably already figured out, and what the session already knows. The main reason I went to Duke Divinity School for continuing education last week, as opposed to some other place, is that Naomi lives 20 minutes away. She could pick us up at the airport. I could use her car. Sandy could spend time with her daughter. But guess what? Though I went to spend time with Naomi, the pastor's conference at Duke Divinity School was the best two-day conference I've ever attended in my 40 years of ministry. There were powerful preachers, dynamic speakers, fluid dancers, wonderful worship leaders, several authors of books, various professors and teachers to teach, preach, and inspire us and I was inspired. I was also appreciative of the fact that in a world where nobody seems to be able to get along, that there was an incredible diversity of speakers and leaders. A black man from North Carolina, an Asian artist of Japanese descent, a white man from South Africa, a Latino woman from Mexico, 
dancers both male and female of various races and ethnic origins, and a singing group that had performed in Nashville. Many preachers, but also a lawyer and a poet. All these speakers and dancers, these singers and other performers, shared two things in common. One, they were all committed followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. And two, they were all believers in the power of persistent prayer. The theme of the conference was from lament to strong hope. And speaker after speaker, preacher after preacher, said the only way to move from lament and sorrow to strong hope is by the power of the Holy Spirit enacted by persistent prayer. We had some wonderful ballet dancers who I found out after they performed were doing, what do you call that, improv dancing where they listened to the music and then just moved as their body moved. But the music kept changing, forcing them to freeze and then change how they danced. The question came from the audience after one of the ballet dances. So, how do you make your body move that quickly to an abrupt change in music? And the dancer said, I pray hard. And then I listen to the spirit and the spirit moves me. Even the artist said that before he created any work of art, he always prayed that God would speak to him through the scriptures and the materials. He's working with an Old Testament biblical scholar to create 150 artwork pieces, one for each of the Psalms. Prayer. But of course, what moved me most were the preachers. Bishop Peter Story, the Methodist Bishop of South Africa for years. He's the one who convicted me, reminded me that my prayer life compared to the great Christians of our age is so meager. I'm reading his book, and I'm only in the second chapter. It's called Protest at Midnight, and it tells the story of how Christians working together brought about a change in South Africa, an apartheid government that oppressed blacks and separated blacks from whites. It was the church, in large part, that led the movement that led to freedom. But I'm not going to tell his story until after... I read the book. Instead, I'm going to tell you what he told us about one of my heroes in the faith, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a black man, Episcopalian. I read his sermons in seminary. Two of his books are on my bookshelf in my study. Peter Story the white Methodist Bishop of South Africa told me something that I didn't know about Bishop Tutu. That he prayed every day for six or seven hours. Every day. Beginning every day with an hour of prayer on his knees. And then he said, do you want me to tell you how persistent he prayed? Wait. Did you hear Christy read the story that Jesus told of the widow who demanded justice from the unjust judge and how she hounded that judge, continually demanding that he rule on her behalf until he vindicated her, not because he wanted to, 
or because he cared about the widow or about justice for that matter, he gave in because she wore him out. So too, Bishop Tutu got the justice he desired for his people in South Africa by wearing out God with his six or seven hours of praying each day and the political leaders of South Africa who finally gave in to his demands for a democratic election after many, many years of being persistently pestered. Bishop Story told this story about Bishop Tutu, how the two of them went deep into South Africa to a region that had a particularly horrible militia and leaders where four pastors had been arrested and thrown in jail. Word got out that they were being tortured. So Bishop Tutu and Bishop Story, representing the Episcopal and Methodist Church, went to see them. They were warned not to go. They went anyway. They went to visit those pastors in prison, demanding that they be allowed to visit. They were, of course, denied. They were met with opposition. And when they persisted, they were physically removed, placed in their car, and then followed. As they were being followed, Bishop Story told me that the fear was building in him. But Bishop Tutu, he was just praying. And sure enough, when they got out in the middle of the bush, they pulled them over, took them out of the car, threw out all their belongings, searched them up and down, guns fixed on them the whole way. Bishop Story said, I knew that I was going to meet my maker. And Bishop Tutu, unconcerned. They didn't kill us, they let us go. So what does Bishop Tutu do as he's driving down the road? He starts praying. And he starts praying so intently, he stops watching the road. I had to reach over, he said, and drive the car because he was looking up and down and everywhere but on the road. And then we got to the airport, he said. And there were guards all around training their guns. And I thought, ah, oh, they decided to let us come to the airport to kill us. And seven o'clock came. And Bishop Tutu pulled out his Anglican prayer book and said, it's seven o'clock, time for evening prayers. And he proceeded to pray right there in the airport, praying for the pastors in prison, praying for themselves, praying for the soldiers. And then came the kicker. When the prayers were over, Bishop Tutu walked up to the guards and said, don't you want to lay down your guns? Don't you want to come over to the winning side? Justice is going to prevail. God is on our side, and you don't want to be against God, do you? No guard laid down his guns, but neither were they killed. And Bishop Story said, I learned in that moment that when you pray, you better be prepared to act upon your prayers as well. That praying with words is not enough. You pray, and then you act. The two go hand in hand. The second story I bring you is from a Methodist bishop in the mountains of North Carolina, Bishop Carter, who told the story of when he first started out in ministry in two small mountain towns in North Carolina. And I smiled because he too was a small two-church pastor in a rural area. During his first year, he said, of ministry at his first church, one day a man showed up that he had never met before. He had seen him around town. But he didn't know the man, but he came in early to church and sat in the back row. But as soon as all the other people came, he started hearing whispers. Do you see who's here today? It's Ermi. Wonder what Ermi's doing here. Apparently the man had never come to church before in his life. But 
Pastor Carter just went on with his service. And when it ended, he shook hands, and Ernie was still sitting in the back row. He waited till everyone was gone. And then he came up to him and said, Are you one of those pastors who anoints people with oil? Bishop Carter said, I think I am. Well, I want you to anoint me, he said. I tell you what, I have another church to get to right now, but I promise I'll call you this afternoon and see what we can set up. He was a young pastor, so he, he called a bunch of his colleagues and said, is that something we Methodists do? Do we anoint people with oil? And they said, yeah, it's in the scriptures. Of course we do, but make sure you bring one of your elders. And so he brought one of his elders and went to see the man and found out that he was dealing with fourth stage cancer and wanted to be anointed that he might be healed. They set a date for the anointing. Pastor came with elders in tow. But before he did the anointing, he went back and reread what Christy read for us before from James about anointing. And before he anointed Ernie, he looked him in the eye and said, Ernie, before I anoint you, is there anything that you want to confess? Are there any sins that are weighing on you? And Ernie said, yes. I have not been kind to my wife. I'm alienated from my son and it's my fault. And I've not been a good neighbor to anyone here in this town. Do you wish to repent of your sins? He asked. Yes, said Ernie. I'm sorry. And his wife who was there forgave him. And Pastor Carter, on behalf of the church, pronounced forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they anointed the man. And guess what? He didn't get better. He died. But at his funeral, Pastor Carter quoted James and said, we anointed him with oil, but guess what that scripture says? Those who are anointed, their souls will be saved and they will be lifted up. Ernie wasn't healed, he said. But he was. Not healed in body, but in spirit and in soul. And now he is raised up. And with his Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, prayer is not a last resort. Bishop Tutu teaches that prayer is a first resort and a middle resort and a last resort. Bishop Carter taught that it's never too late to pray or too early. Jesus said, pray like a persistent widow, for will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? I tell you, God will give them justice. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Brothers and sisters, pray. Act. Demonstrate your faith. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the witness of those who go before us, for the great prayer warriors of the faith. Help us to pray night and day for the sick, for those who struggle, for those who mourn, for our world. Help us rejoice in your goodness and in your blessings. And let us remember the prayers of the righteous availeth much. Teach us to pray together. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn, a hymn of faith and prayer, 361, My Faith Looks Up to Thee.